All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is such an awesome meeting. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the organizers for putting it together. And um, I'm excited to be giving a talk about some uh, new data that we have on ways that we can look uh, for signatures of coevolution between humans and uh, human hosts and their uh, microbial uh, buddies. So those of us that study the developmental origins of health and disease are very familiar with the fact that most of the research in that area actually focuses on uh, prenatal or even uh, insults during pregnancy because the earlier an insult occurs or environmental experience, the greater the phenotypic consequence for the developing neonate. However, I'm particularly interested in the postnatal period because there are two unique challenges that emerge. These are that the neonate becomes uh, very behaviorally active, engaging in contingent social interactions in socially complex species. And compared to the prenatal environment, they are dealing with a much expanded microbial complexity. And all of this, of course, is framed by mother's milk. It provides the fuel for the behavioral activity, and it also helps provide protection and uh, advantages to st uh, certain bacteria. Now, this is, it was really great to uh, follow the keynote this morning. Uh, Barbara talked a lot about lactation and pregnancy and the um, lactation in the mammary gland. And what astonishes me as an evolutionary biologist is how little we actually know about mother's milk. We know uh, appreciably much more about the super function of the mammary gland in uh, dairy species. We know a lot about the dysfunction of the mammary gland in terms of breast cancer. Uh, on my way down here, a new article hit the news comparing uh, actual breast milk with this kind of pseudo-functional replacement that you can buy commercially, of course, I'm talking about infant formulas. But we know relatively little about the adaptation that natural selection has shaped to provide the first nourishment to the postnatal developing neonate. And what's really important when we think about mother's milk, it's not just food, it's also medicine, it's also hormonal signal, and it doesn't just feed the infant. It also feeds through these specialized sugars that are in breast milk, the bacteria that are colonizing the infant's intestinal tract in the postnatal period. The microbiome is really hot right now. I think we all are very, very aware of that. And uh, although the 100, mil 100 trillion microorganism number is currently experiencing some adjustment, what we know unequivocally is that we carry around with us many, many, many microbial buddies that exert absolutely instrumental functions within our body. So they are uh, critically important for the bioavailability of many of the minerals that we take in in our diet. They uh, help acquire energy in our diet. And they also are incredibly important immune regulators. So they uh, interact with our own immune system to help protect us. And when we are preferentially colonized by beneficial bacteria, their presence within our intestinal tract functions as a competitive inhibitor from more pathogenic bacteria that we may encounter in our environment. Now, um, that slide was supposed to go with all the things I just said. So there are the bacteria in your gut epithelium. And we now know that mothers are producing, mammalian mothers are producing oligosaccharides. These are special milk glycans that we as placental mammals do not have the enzymes to cleave within our stomach. So these oligosaccharides pass mostly intact into the lower intestinal tract where they interact with the bacteria in our, in our infant's guts. So Bifidobacterium infantis is uh, the most prevalent bacteria in a healthy, typically developing neonate, and it can exist exclusively off of just one particular oligosaccharide. It has signatures of coevolution in, in how it utilizes this carbohydrate that mothers are producing for it. Other oligosaccharides um, feed other bacteria. Some oligosaccharides have uh, different kinds of structures that serve as decoys to pathogenic bacteria. So they basically signal that their gut epithelium, pathogenic bacteria attached to them, and then get flushed out with feces. And, and 
this is a wonderfully symbiotic system between the mother, the infant that she's nourishing, and the bacteria that are colonizing that infant's body. And humans are really spectacular in the oligosaccharides that we produce. The third most common constituent in human breast milk are these special milk glycans. So mothers are exerting a huge amount of effort during lactation to feed the bacteria and not their infants. And this is quite important because we're very different than all of our primate relatives that have been studied to date. So when you look at the milk of other primates, what you find is that humans are characterized by producing an order of magnitude more oligosaccharide isomers, and that they are significantly more complex than is found in the milk of chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, monkeys, or, or lemurs. Some of the ways that these oligosaccharides are constructed within the mammary gland involve the addition of a, fucosal, a, a fucose group to the milk. So, and this is regulated by the FUT2 gene. So there's heritability in the kinds of oligosaccharides that mothers are making. So those of us that are uh, evolutionists, we always think about, is it heritable? Is there variation? And does it confer a fitness benefit? I'm going to try and convince you today that this is all the case with these oligosaccharides. Whether or not mothers are attaching a fucose group to their oligosaccharides largely co-varies with their secretor status. So secretor mothers are more likely to be adding fucose groups than our non-secretor mothers. And we find, not, not my group, but in general scientists, have found that fucosylization of these oligosaccharides is incredibly protective against diarrhea. So individuals that are secretors are better at fighting bacteria. Uh, individuals that are non-secretors are generally known to be better at fighting viruses. Diarrhea is a really important issue in terms of neonatal mortality. So globally, diarrheal disease is one of the leading causes of death of infants and children. And oligosaccharides can help protect against rotaviruses and things like that. But this is not an issue just in terms of the global south. This also has important implications for premature infants who are at incredibly high risk for neck, necrotizing intercolitis. This is one of the leading causes of uh, requirements for surgery and death in very premature infants. Pathogenic bacteria invade their intestinal tract and, and cause a horrible, horrible sepsis. These oligosaccharides can help prevent the development of NEC and is why so many NICUs are switching over to using donor milk compared to formula. So to summarize kind of the state of the knowledge about these human milk oligosaccharides, we know that they're somewhere in the neighborhood of between 400 and 1,000 different isomers that are seemingly being constructed in the mammary gland but that individual mothers themselves are only producing a subset of these. Part of that variation is explained by the FUT2 gene, but not all of it. One of the things that I've really been interested in and predicted is that since these bacteria are instrumental in how we utilize the food we consume and helping us fight pathogens we encounter in our environment, we would expect the oligosaccharide profiles of mothers to reflect aspects of their nutritional and their disease ecology. So today I'll be presenting some preliminary data uh, that uh, we've been collaboratively doing to try and understand what predicts variation in oligosaccharide profiles. This is a her her Herculean effort among many colleagues. Many are here today, wonderfully. And working with glycobiologists at UC Davis and a number of human behavioral ecologists that either collected milk uh, for this study or had it archived from their own research, we were able to look at a variety of human populations, milk oligosaccharide profiles. So we have uh, the population for which we know the most about, of course, are westernized urban women. So we have a population that we've collected from Boston. We also looked at Polish women that are living uh, in mountainous regions that still engage in a lot of traditional farming uh, with animals because they can't use a lot of mechanized methods in the mountains. So they have kind of a mixed agricultural shop foraging. Similarly, uh, women in Cebu, Philippines, 
also characterize subsistence pattern in general, this kind of mixed agricultural, horticultural shop foraging. And the toba, which uh, until recent generations were hunters and gatherers uh, in South America, but have now become increasingly sedentary and utilizing shop foraging tactics. We looked at a population of pastoralists in the Himalayas that are yak herders, and a population of pastoralists in the semi-arid deserts of Namibia, the Himba people. And as you just heard about in Mike's talk, we also have samples from the Chimani, who we've characterized as mixed horticultural foraging uh, population. Now, what we found is that most mothers across populations show evidence of a secretor phenotype. Right, so this is the proportion of mothers who were, having, who were producing oligosaccharides that had the added fucose groups. And what you find is across these different subsistence strategies, with one notable exception, you find that about 70 to 85 percent of mothers are secreting, are producing oligosaccharides that are most effective at fighting diarrheal disease. The Chimani, 100 percent of our subjects were secretor status. The glycobiologist actually emailed Melanie Martin and Mike and I asking for more samples because he'd never encountered a population in which all individuals were secretor phenotype. When we had 52 subjects, the, the data didn't change. Right? All of these mothers are adding fucose groups to their, oligo, their milk oligosaccharides. These are each of the individual populations. Uh, but the best fit for the data, looking at principal components analysis, is actually by looking at the subsistence pattern. So, sorry, whenever you do a PCA, you kind of want to know how much variation is explained by your two, your two dimensions. Uh, we're at um, over 80% when we look at it this way. But when we look at the HMO profiles by subsistence pattern, which I've already described here, and the colors are going to match what you see in the graph, horticultural foragers, pastoralists, rural shop, and urban, what you find is that subsistence strategy is the best explanation for the milk oligosaccharide profiles that human mothers are producing. Not their parity, not the sex of their infant, which are typically my topics that I am interested in when I, when I study milk. It's the subsistence pattern. And what you can find is these right here, these are the pastoralists. They look just shifted very different. Here are the two other subsistence patterns, and here are Western urban women. Most of everything that we know in the literature is coming from Western urban women, and it's capturing very little of the, the variation that we're seeing humans demonstrate. Now, together this adds up to over 90% of the variation explained by the first two principal components. Other things that we can look at in milk are the innate and adaptive proteins. And I can tell you that you can explain more of the variation, but you need to come to Laura Klein's poster <laughs> this evening. She's a graduate student in the Comparative Lactation Lab, and she'll be able to tell you about the differences or similarities of innate and adaptive proteins across subsistence patterns. One of the things I really struggle with when I think about uh, adaptive, or when I think about adaptive variation in nutritional versus disease ecology is how do we untangle nutritional and disease ecology? The foods we eat and, and the animals we live with can influence both our nutrition and the potential for zoonotic disease transmission. And lastly, one of the things to keep in mind is that these oligosaccharides are doing these incredibly important instrumental things for the infant's health and development. Okay? But this also creates a perspective where we have new landscapes to think about parent-offspring conflict, that mothers could be shaping bacteria to influence infant behavior in her interest rather than the infant's. So you can think about how we now know that there's microbial endocrinology, that microbes are sending signals to our brain that influence our behavior. And so mothers can be making oligosaccharides that benefit the baby in terms of health and nutrition, but also at almost no cost to herself, with infants very handicapped in how they can fight back, influence their behavior. So this is also work that's being done in our lab, and Carrie's here too, and would, I'm sure, love to talk to people. So thank you for your attention, and thank you for this conference. <laughs> <laughs>